Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Chad here with IRAC Veteran 8888. Today we have a very special video for you. We're going to be talking about big bore revolver hunting and uh, we got to take some animals with some big bore revolvers so we want to pass along a few, some of the things we've learned and also just talk about how fun it was and, and maybe give you some of the specifics on the guns and the ammo. Uh, so strap in, we're going to dive into this a little bit. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank our friends at Sonoran Desert Institute for supporting our videos. They have some awesome distance learning gunsmithing programs. Uh, you can learn about reloading. If you're looking to get into the firearms industry as a professional, they have some great programs. Uh, their instructors are amazing, great financial incentives. So check them out, SDI, Sonoran Desert Institute, and tell them we sent you over there. All right, so we've been using revolvers in some capacity for hunting for quite some time. Uh, last year on a hunt, I had my four inch 629 and I had a chance to take a doe uh, with my 629 and she was so close I couldn't even maneuver my rifle without getting detected. I was in a small box blind, uh, kind of like an enclosed blind. So I pulled my revolver out and I just sat it on the edge of the ledge there. I mean, she was literally only like maybe nine or 10 yards away fired a shot, good solid neck shot, instant incapacitation, very humane shot on the uh, deer. And that got the gears turning a little mm -hmm. bit, right? So we have to have this backstory. That got the gears turning. Hey, well, what if we filmed, you know, uh, a bit of big bore revolver hunting to see how hard and challenging this really can be with some of the larger uh, X-frame revolvers. So Smith & Wesson uh, was kind enough to send out an X-Frame in 460, mm -hmm. and also an X-Frame in 500 Magnum, and we've got a Performance Center 44 Magnum Hunter as well. Uh, so we were able to uh, get a couple of shots on some uh, does with the 44, and Chad was able to log a kill with the 460 here. We've yet to kill one with the 500 yet because we're still waiting on an optic to come in. But let's just sort of talk about the experience, how we feel about it. Um, we'll talk about some of the ballistic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, advantages of 460 Magnum. Uh, it's a great revolver cartridge. And, you know, what are, I guess the, the important thing to identify, Chad, out the gate is, what are some of the advantages of using a revolver to hunt versus a rifle? Well, what's funny is, um, you know, Eric and I were having a kind of a joking conversation about this the other day. But, you know, when Eric does something, it's like, man, I got to do that too or I buy something, he's like, man, that's cool. I gotta have one of those too. So he kills a deer with a revolver. I'm like, man, I gotta kill a deer with a revolver, but I gotta one up him though. Yeah. But like, I've been talking about hunting with uh, my classic DX, also in 44 Magnum for a while, and I just never got that gun set up until just recently. Um, but, you know, I've known about the 460 for a while, and if you guys aren't familiar with this, when Smith introduced the 460 Magnum in the X-Frame, uh, which the X-Frame is the largest frame revolver that they make. It was meant to handle uh, the 500 Smith & Wesson. So it was like the largest production revolver pretty much ever made uh, at the time, I believe, and the most powerful you know, Magnum handgun cartridge available at the time. And I think still it, it kind of you know, is at the top end. But the 460 is a 451-452 diameter projectile moving at well over 2,000 feet per second. So this is still touted as the world's fastest revolver cartridge and um, production. The the fastest production revolver cartridge. Yes, <laughs> we don't. We're not going to talk about the Wildcats, but yeah. um, the the advantages of this cartridge is you get a very very long point blank zero range out to 200 to 250 yards, depending on the uh, projectile and the barrel length that you're running. Um, in this particular instance, we've been running the 200 grain Hornet the FTXs. And uh, in my initial like load development, um, I was pushing these pills to 2,300 feet per second, which is still well within the bounds of what this revolver can handle. Um, but I wasn't getting the accuracy that I was looking for, so I dumbed it back down a little bit, but we're still running 2,130 feet per second, delivering just over 2,000 foot-pounds of energy at the muzzle. I mean, that is an obscene amount of energy. I mean, just for comparative sake, yeah. like a full-size 44 Magnum, you're only generating about 800 foot-pounds of energy. I mean, just to put it into perspective. And another so. way to put that into perspective is many people consider 1,000 foot-pounds of energy to be about the adequate amount of energy needed to humanely dispatch, let's just say, especially a white-tailed deer. Now, when you think about, you know, at the muzzle, 
a 44 Magnum generating 800 foot-pounds of energy is certainly no slouch. Now, mm -hmm. you can still uh, humanely take down game animals with a 44 Magnum, as I've definitely demonstrated mm -hmm. with my 4-inch 629. Placement. Shot placement yeah. is a thing, but also distance, right? You may not be able to shoot as far away. Now, with a traditional revolver with iron sights, if you're a good shot, you can absolutely deliver a humane kill mm -hmm. um, on a game animal if you need to. But this concept opens the doors in a very, very great way because you're extending that standoff distance of what a wheel gun can humanely do. So you're talking with that much energy, you've got energy on tap to where you can certainly take animals uh, down at longer distances. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't imagine firing um, this, this pistol uh, at a game animal over 150 or 200 yards away, you'd have to have it really, really, we're going to talk about that yeah. a little bit, but <laughs> but you have to have it really, really well balanced and well um, sandbagged in order to make a shot like that. Um, it can be a little bit more mm. difficult to hold onto the gun and, and have a good consistent sight picture. We're going to talk about that mm. a little bit. So the advantages, you know, let's just say ballistically, um, you get better standoff range. Mm with the 460 yeah. and the 500 yeah. also is a behemoth of a cartridge in terms of revolver hunting. Yep. Yeah, you get you're you're getting into like rifle-like energy with these cartridges. That's a good way um, to put it. So like, you know, traditional 3030, you know, with a full length like say 20 inch barrel running like a 150 gram pill, you know, you're going to be right around that 2000 foot pound mark, you know, give or take. Um, so this is a revolver that can generate rifle-like energies at the muzzle. Now, I will say, these things are a little bit more challenging to shoot accurately, okay? Um, like Eric mentioned, they, you, you really do need to rest them uh, very stable, okay? You can't just really put it on the bar and, you know, be shaking all around and stuff. You gotta be able to get it relatively still and just have perfect trigger control and discipline to mm -hmm. shoot these things well. Um, it's not easy. No, but uh, as far as the setup goes, this is the uh, this is the ten and a half inch barrel model with the uh, muzzle brake attached on it. So long barrel, a lot of barrel length to get that powder burned up and really get that bullet pushed out of there uh, very fast. Um, most of the data that you see out there on like the factory loadings are from like the eight and three eighths inch barrel, I believe. That's kind of the more standardized model. I believe that's the barrel length that they first introduced this revolver in. But um, this one has a little pick rail on top. We've got some worn maximal rings with a Leupold. Uh, this is a two and a half to eight by 32 VX3 uh, with just a standard duplex. Um, it, it's a little bit obscene, but really to get the most potential out of these revolvers, you do have to run an optic on there. If I was only hunting maybe within about 50 yards, I'd probably run the irons uh, because the fiber optic green front is just really bright under daytime conditions. And it even picks up a little bit of the light, you know, going into twilight hours and such too. But, um, you know, just having the optic on there to gather that extra light and really place your shots precisely where you want them is really a benefit. Um, every, everything else on the gun is just stock. Um, now, these revolvers, the larger size ones, come with sling swivels on there. And um, it does come with a sling from the factory, but we had our buddy Chad over at Flatline Fiber make us some custom revolver slings. Which may be available... They might. If uh, you guys want a revolver sling, we might be able mm. to make that happen uh, and yep. make it a make it a full time item. If it's something you guys are yep. interested in, just let us know. But uh, considering the weight of this setup with the optic and everything, it weighs right around about six pounds. So when you think six pounds, all right, that's like a super extra lightweight like mountain rifle. Okay, but mm -hmm. you know those are going to have carbon barrels or real thin pencil barrels and things on there. You run like lightweight optics. They've got a lightweight like fiberglass or carbon fiber stock. I mean, this this is a heavy pistol, you know, a heavy revolver, but it totes really easily, like with the sling on there, just riding around and such. No big deal. Now, if we were to, let's say, we start looking for similar energy that this revolver can develop in a rifle, okay, what would that put us in the line of? Maybe to get even close to this weight, we'd have to get maybe a single shot Henry or something, mm -hmm. and 4570 yeah. would be getting you close, right? Or maybe a uh, maybe a Ruger American and 450 mm -hmm. Bushmaster or something might start to get to this mm -hmm. type of weight. One thing I'd like to add about the optics is that uh, Leupold makes a couple of different um, handgun optics. One of them is a fixed four power uh, extended eye relief optic. That's the one we opted for on the DX mm -hmm. and the uh, Performance Center uh, Hunter, uh, which was the one that Matt was shooting. The reason that I, I think the two and a half 
um, to it's a six power, eight, eight power yeah, on eight the top power. end. Yep. The reason the two and a half to eight is such a great choice is because if you do want to dial the, the magnification down low, say they're in really close, then you, you can. You can dial it out and get a super wide field mm -hmm. if you want. And you get a little more power on tap because now instead of having a fixed four power, you can go all the way up to eight power, which is nice. And because this bell is larger, it does, um, you know, let a little more light in, which gives you better visibility. That was one minor complaint that Matt had uh, when he was shooting the 44 Magnum Performance Center using the four power gold ring mm -hmm. Leupold was that, you know, it was there near dusk and I wish I would have had a little bit more light. Now I will say this. Leupolds are great when it comes to, you know, their lenses and their coatings are fantastic when it comes to getting all the available light in. And um, there's a lot of people out there that would say, well, well, it's a macho thing, you know. Oh, well, if you can't shoot iron sights, what business do you have running this? One of my observations about that, uh, I did take a deer with my old German cape gun. You know, that's just a black powder rifle with iron sights. A morning hunt pristine. I love hunting irons in the morning. No problem. In the evening, you guys know a lot of those deer will come in real late and when, and you need that additional bit of shooting light. That is legal shooting light. The last, you know, five to ten minutes of legal shooting light with irons can be really hard, right? Like what did our dads and our grandpas tell us way back in the day, right? Oh, well just sit in the stand in the evening till you can't see the sights anymore. Well, why do that? Why limit yourself to what you can shoot just because you don't have an optic on your gun? So that's one thing I love about the Louis. The gold rings are great. They do give you that additional light transmission that you need to make a humane shot on an animal in low light conditions. So yeah, it's just something it. worth looking at, and especially with a revolver. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I would want to have an optic yeah. on it. For what sure. do they say? If you can't see it, you can't shoot it. Right? You can't. You can't shoot it if you can't um, see it. So, like, accuracy potential with these things. All right, so when I was doing all my load development, I went out and I figured out point-blank zero range, you know, that would give the the flattest trajectory, all right? Because if we all know, like, line of sight is a straight line, right? But the bullet's going to arc over your line of sight and then back down out of your line of sight to a certain point. Point-blank zero range is what's typically used in hunting scenarios because you can zero your rifle, like, say, a couple inches high at 100 yards, and you got a point-blank zero range to be able to hit you know, that vital area on a, on a whitetail or a similar size medium game animal out to extended ranges because that bullet will drop to the bottom end of that, you know, that target area, right? Yeah, you remember your grandpa so, zero in his 30 alt six, two inches high at 100 yards? Yeah. So Same you, type of thing. You so. get like a, a 200 yard zero more or less. So anything within that range, you just put the, put the crosshair on it, the duplex, and pull the trigger, right? So 18, gently. yeah, gently, all right, and carefully, 18 yards is where I zero this gun and I confirmed it at 169. That gives me a point blank range out to 200 yards with it only going about three and a half inches high at hundred, right? So I went out and I shot like literally the same hole at 18 yards shooting inch groups at 50, two to three inch yeah. groups at hundred. All right. I went and I confirmed this thing out at 169 yards on paper. I put three shots within the size of my fist. Perfectly All right? acceptable. And that was shooting off of the tricorn bag here from Coltac, and I was just using the hog saddle, and I was sitting on the ground. I didn't even have, like, a super stable rest. And I wanted to mimic the, the position that I would be in in the blinds or in a tree stand, right? I'm not going to have, you know, a, a tabletop with a nice solid rest, you know, most of the time. I'm going to be shooting off of, like, the edge of the blind, which that's how I was actually hunting. I, I was using the edge of the blind and a, a shooting stick just to kind of support the rear of the bag. And I just put the gun on top of that bag. And like, you know, the crosshair was moving just in little figure eight ever so slightly on my target. And I mean, dude, it, it is a challenge to hunt with a revolver, but I wanted something a little bit different than just going out and shooting a high powered rifle and it, it being a relatively easy scenario. I wanted, you know, a challenge this year and um, yeah, we went out multiple times hunting. And one of the first hunts that I went on, we were actually guiding uh, John and Sir Michael from Guns Out TV on a recent hunt that they went on. Um, and we got to hunt at the tail end of that. And I saw a lot of deer, uh, even uh, mostly bucks. I didn't see a single doe any time that I've been out this year, but uh, I let all those bucks walk. You know, I saw spikes, saw crab claws, a little four pointer, and even like a reasonable size eight, but he was still a juvenile deer. Um, but when we, we got back out this last time, uh, you know, I actually hit pay dirt because it was late in the season. And at that point, you know, you just kind of wanted to fill the freezer. Um, but I was sitting out there one morning 
and I had this spike walk in, and um, it was way too dark. I mean, I could barely make him out, and I thought it was a doe at first, but I usually carry the Terrapin rangefinder with me. That way I've got eight power, okay, an eight power optic to actually scan around and get a little bit more detail on what I'm looking at. Well, Plus, it kind of serves as both a spotting, exactly. you know, you, you can you can use it almost like a binocular yep. and a rangefinder. Yep. So, so you've got you know, two I'm to carry one. extra equipment yep. with you. And it's important to me because you know, being able to range my targets properly, especially with something like this, that you really have to put your shots precisely where you want them. Because uh, some of the places we shoot, you know, you could have a 30 yard shot or you could have like a 140 yard shot, you know, and the distances are very deceiving unless you've been out there a lot and, and have landmarks to go off of or whatnot. But um, anyways, I had this spike walk out real early and then he walked back into the woods and uh, I was like, man, you know, I wonder if he'll come back out, I'll be able to shoot him. Um, but he wound up coming back out and um, yeah, we were able to take him down. You know, that, that was an amazing shot that you made there. I mean, it ended up being about 90 yards. Yeah, right at 90 yards. 90 yards. So that was a good test because that gives us an idea of what this bullet can do, you know, at typical rifle deer hunting uh, ranges, especially here in Georgia. I mean, most shots in Georgia are not going to be over 100 yards. Mm -hmm. Now, your mileage may vary in terms of where you hunt. Now, you might be in an area where you you might have to take some longer shots at deer, right? Mm -hmm. And some of us who have killed some big bucks over the years, sometimes a wily buck may not come in uh, as close, and you might have to take a 150, 200 yard shot. It might be the only shot you've got. Yeah. So um, it's <clears> interesting <throat> that you didn't get 110% complete pass through. No. Now, to be fair, this cow horn that you shot was not a small deer by any stretch mm -hmm. of imagination. He was certainly had, he was healthy and he had bulked up a lot because we feed him a lot of corn and everything like that throughout the year. So we'd like to make sure the deer are healthy. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not gonna get into nutrition and game management. That is a completely separate video. I could go down the rabbit hole on that. I'm not gonna torture you guys with that, but let's just say they fed, all right? So we feed him good and uh, he had bulked up pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, initially, you know, I, I went out there and I helped you look for this deer. And we were having a little bit of a hard time finding blood trail because as we ended up determining, you didn't get a complete pass through yeah. on the projectile. Now those Hornadies are kind of known for that, aren't they? About not, not passing through completely. Yeah, so, you know. That's not a dig the, on Hornady, it's just the reality. Yeah, I mean. the, the word on the street is that this particular projectile in this particular cartridge, the 460, has been known to not perform exceptionally well on medium-sized game. Like, the complaints that I saw were, number one, you don't get 100% pass-through. Number two, the bullet breaks up. So the core separates from the jacket, and you know it still dumps a good bit of energy. It just doesn't dump as much energy as it potentially could. But obviously, it's still enough to take this, this deer down. But, you know, this is one of the few deer that I've ever shot that ran off. Like most of the deer that I shoot, they drop right in the tracks and they're done for just with a good center mass shot. But this guy, he ran eh, maybe like 25 yards into the woods or so. And, um, you know, we, we recovered the projectile or what was left of it. And we've got a small piece at the core and then the rest of it was just kind of broken up in there. And then a small piece of jacket. Now, like this comes out to 136 point uh, six grains remaining, all right, what we could recover. So that's like Half six, its weight. 68 percent weight retention. So mm. most hunting bullets, you know, you want at least like 90 percent weight retention. And the projectiles that I really wanted to use for this uh, were the Barnes uh, XPBs. They have a 200 grain 451 that's specifically designed for revolver applications. Um, for the 460 and you know even for like the 454 Casul and, and such like that. Those projectiles are unobtainium. Though. They're unobtainium. Like I've been looking for four months for those projectiles and they are non-existent locally online. Uh, but once I can find those projectiles, I want to try using the barn solid because you know word on the street. I mean barns, you know bullets for hunting are exceptional and we've shot some of the 275s in the 500 before and those bullets are. Pretty boss. We've never hunted stuff. Yeah, we've never hunted with them before, but we've done some destruction videos and stuff, and I've I've chronographed them. And buddy, 
I want to try some barns in this thing. I want to talk know? a little bit about wounding characteristics. Yeah, let's go. Briefly. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's important for this application now. Like, the thing I like about the 460 and the 500, it's a big old honking bullet, mm -hmm. right? You've got some good velocity. So there's a lot of things to like there. Uh, now, unfortunately, we weren't able to log a kill with the 500 just yet. We will do mm -hmm. that in this upcoming deer season. Who knows? We might even go shoot some hogs. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have hogs on the property, so... Um, I'll put some cameras out and I'll see if I can figure out where the hogs are coming through on the property and we might do some daytime hunting uh, with these things and see if we can log a couple of uh, hog uh, kills with the revolver with the 500. But in terms of the wounding characteristics, like one would ask, okay, well, what if you could take a gas check line of type projectile uh, with a good flat nose on it and some good heavy weight and just load it on a case crushing charge of powder and get your accuracy node where you want it, your velocity node just right to where the gun is really delivering what you want it to deliver. Now, granted, I'm not sure we could push a cast bullet that fast, uh, but being, you know, maybe a heat-treated linotype with a gas mm -hmm. check, powder possibly, coated. possibly. Mm -hmm. If you powder coated them, you might be able to get them moving fast. All right, so a solid, for instance, like um, some of the Woodley projectiles, the Lehigh projectiles, uh, some of the Underwood offerings, you know, they're just solids. Um, but with that big flat mail pat on that bullet, see, the nice thing about this particular bullet from Hornady, the FTX, is that it flies nice and flat. It's got a better, a higher BC, which, you know, translates to better uh, trajectory at longer range. Now, all right, if we were to do a big old honking, heavy, flat nose projectile, now, are we going to get that 200 yard uh, power that we expect, uh, you know, and the flat trajectory, likely not. It's going to, you know, drop a little more. Now, we don't know what that drop is yet because we haven't really done the testing, but I would imagine the nice thing about that flat nose, though, being a solid and it's not going to lose any weight. It's going to push a clean hull all the way through. It's going to have great wounding characteristics. You have to remember, guys, that animals have been killed with cast bullets for years and years and years and years, right? Uh, a good old cast bullet is nothing to uh, shake a stick at. They certainly will do the work. I've loaded up cast uh, rounds for the 500 Magnum that have worked exceptionally well. Um, it's got generous case capacity. The bullets are heavy. So as long as your shots aren't maybe, let's just say for the purposes of using a cast bullet, let's say you're not going to shoot over 100 yards. I would imagine that application be downright perfect. Um, it'd probably shoot pretty flat out to 100 and still have some really good energy. The nice thing about big bore hunting revolvers and big bore rifles in general, like 4570, 500 Magnum, whatever, what have you, is that if you get complete pass through, what you're looking for is you've got a lot of bloodletting. Mm -hmm. So once that projectile gets through, especially if it's a good lung shot, you look down, you've got pink frothy blood, and more than likely the deer has not gone far at all if, you know, barely off the trail. So having that good wounding characteristic in a bullet design is a super crucial part of this package being a successful package. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously the Hornady's did the job. Mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to mention earlier on um, is one of, the, heavy. No. one of the unique features of the 460 specifically is uh, the way the barrel is rifled. So they have what's called a gain twist rifling. They start out in the throat with straight rifling and then it gradually increases to 1 in 20 by the time the projectile gets to the muzzle. So one of the benefits of that gain twist rifling is that the guns don't torque as bad as some of the other big bore offerings. Like the big 500s, you know, they, they want to torque over because you're, you're kind of, you know, spinning that bullet so fast right out of the gate, it really just twists the gun almost out of your hands. This gun is a pleasant uh, revolver to shoot. Um, Especially and, with that break. Oh yeah, absolutely. The weight and the break really contribute to that. But uh, Eric and I were making the observation last time we were out shooting this gun, the 500, and like the four inch 44, uh, the 629s that we have. The 629 has more felt recoil than this gun does because number one, it's lightweight. It's a little short barrel. You know, it doesn't have any gain twist rifling and whatnot. And we're running full power, 240 grain loads out of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but th those guns are half the weight of this guy. And it, it, you think like 460 big bore, you think it's going to be a complete like powerhouse and it's going to jump out of your hand. It's really not bad at all. These guns are a pleasure to shoot. Yeah. So one thing I'd like to add. So I think at this point in the video, we can certainly surmise here, right? That, all right, pros on this. Mm -hmm. 
It's easy to get in and out of a stand with it. Mm -hmm. Super easy to carry around. Nice and convenient with the sling here that we've got from Flatline Fiber, which are available. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Ding. Go pick yourself up one. But it's a very easy gun to carry around. Uh, the optic does generate some good light transmission, so you get that similar type of light transmission you're going to expect out of your deer hunting rifle. So that translates well. Uh, stainless steel on the finish, so that's kind of nice. Keeps it from corroding when you're out in the in the elements. Oh, uh, we so were that's a, we that's were a out, pro. We were out in the elements. <laughs> that is certainly sure. a pro. Uh, a few cons that I I could think of is uh, one in the field. Uh, it certainly can be a considerably more difficult setup to set your shot up and keep it steady and control the gun. So you do have to be a little bit more exacting and precise mm. in your movements. Uh, another con that I could think of would be, you know, having to carry around extra gear like the, like, now you don't have to have this tricorn bag, but it definitely makes life a ton easier. Uh, so one con could be, oh, well, you have to carry an extra shooting bag, an extra shooting stick. Uh, don't even get me started on the extra stuff you got to carry because filming deer hunting is really hard. And Chad spent a lot of time, you know, he had to walk in with his tricorn, the revolver, the shooting stick, and carry in all the filming equipment all on his own. And I did the same thing. Um, I did several sets with the revolver and I wasn't able to get, um, you know, a kill on film. Um, but that's just, it goes to show, it, you are going to have a little bit more gear to carry around. So that's just something to consider. Um, but I would, I would say the pros outweigh the cons. Uh, if you want to challenge yourself, I think a, a revolver hunting video or, you know, doing anything related to revolver hunting is certainly going to be a challenge. It was challenging for us to put this video together. That's it. See? Easy. You, you just go. have to solve the problem. That's right. Right? Hill people, little tip pouch here. Hang the bag on there. There you go. Revolver slings over and then I can tote my camera on the tripod. I can tote my shooting stick. Yeah, mm -hmm. and everything else is gravy. That's right. And like you mentioned, and you it, still have to maneuver your rifle regardless. Look, you're getting in and out of the deer stands, you know, you don't have to climb up in the stand with a string attached to your gun and then haul your gun up there and all that mess. You can just tote it just like this and not have anything to worry about. I like it. But it worked out real good. Yeah, man. And um, a, a quick note on the Hill People uh, packs. I really love these tip pouches, and they're arguably one of my favorite pieces of field gear. Uh, I know that's sort of outside the bounds of this video, but I figure we talk about it. Um, but that, that Hill People pouch, mm -hmm. bring it back over here. You notice that Chad's got his tourniquet here on the bottom of the pouch. Mm -hmm. So that way you've got a little medical on you just in case there is a mishap or an issue. Uh, Hill People makes this particular pack also with Molly on the front. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can add some of your little Molly goodies and things, but this is a great way to carry around uh, your rangefinder, your wind bottle, mm -hmm. all of the things you carry. And what I like to do is if I'm going to park my truck or something or walk in or, you know, whatever, I don't like to have my keys in my pocket, my wallet in my pocket, and all of my crap in my pocket. I, I like to have everything off my waist so I can maneuver quietly and not, not having anything jiggle around mm -hmm. or make noise. So this is a great way to stage up your keys, your wallet, your phone, all mm -hmm. your crap, your, your junk your that junk. you're taking with you. And it's right there and it's convenient. Mm -hmm. So when you're wearing this thing, if you need to check your phone, you can just... What I do is when I get in the stand, I'll unzip it and I'll, I'll, leave, <laughs> I'll leave the zippers about right here. And that way when I'm sitting in the stand, there you go. Loop. If I'm sitting in the stand and I need to access my phone... Yep. It's right there. You can just lift it up, check it, put it back. Just don't do it before the sun comes up. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it before the sun comes up. But that's a great piece of gear and arguably probably one of the most useful pieces of field gear mm -hmm. uh, that I have found for hunting are the Hill People packs. Mm -hmm. And we, we love them collectively. We could I almost. I can speak for Chad, I believe, when, yeah. you know, that's a good piece of gear. We could almost do a complete video on just, like, hunting accruciaments, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah. You know? We probably will. So, you know, there's a lot of gear that Chad and I have um, have settled in over the years and some of it's been trial and error and some of it's been stuff that's probably still adequate but maybe at the end of the day we decide well maybe there's a better way to skin this uh skin this cat right Just so skin this bobcat um the, yeah for real the the hill people stuff is great we'll probably do a separate video breaking down all the equipment we use when we're out on a deer hunt because that is a common question that we get now on the big bore revolver hunting element of this particular video that's the main focus of this video is the big bore revolvers um, you know, Matt was able to log a couple of kills with his 44 Magnum. Uh, now that gun, had, I think it was a eight and three quarter or seven and a half, seven and a half yeah. inch barrel, seven and a half inch barrel with a monster break on it. And we're running the, the VX two four power fixed, right? 
from Leupold. Now on that particular gun, he was using the Remington uh, hollow point. The uh, HTPs. H, yeah, HTPs. High terminal performance. High terminal performance. So he was using the Remington 44 Magnum mm -hmm. uh, ammo in that particular gun, and he was able to log two different kills. Uh, one deer was over 90 yards away. So again, very similar distance and to what Chad was shooting. And the second deer was on the move. <laughs> it was moving, and he took a 90-yard shot at this deer moving and hit it with that performance center, 7.5-inch 44. So um, I, unfortunately, was not able to log a uh, revolver kill on film. Um, this year, I did get... Well, last year, I did get the 629 with the mm -hmm. one deer you saw earlier, but um, I think it's a really awesome way to challenge yourself. It is. Right, it's a challenge. Um, it's also great for you know if you have difficulty maneuvering a rifle. Uh, I will say this: when you're in the stand, especially if it's a box blind with hard sides, mm -hmm. and you have to make a, a wide adjustment. Say that a deer pops out on your right, and you've got to make this huge move to reorient mm -hmm. yourself. It is much easier to reorient this revolver mm -hmm. uh, in a tight space than it is to swing a rifle, especially if you're running a a rifle with a long can on it, mm -hmm. and it's heavy and it's cumbersome. It can be difficult to maneuver if you've got to make a wide swing, you know. So hmm. that is nice. It is very maneuverable. I will say, um, one of the stands that I did sit in a couple of times this year is one we call the W. It's a big box blind that's up on stilts, and it overlooks multiple roads coming into a food plot. And um, I will say that, like, running this bag on the 2x4 ledge was extremely stable. It was just like shooting this gun off the bench. But the disadvantage to that stand is I had the camera set up beside me and leveled out, and I had it to the point where I could just reach up and move it around to get, you know, an, uh, a shot on each one of these lanes, depending on where the deer came out. But number one disadvantage to that is you're, you're creating excess movement if there are deer present, right? And if the deer do pop out on those lanes, they may not stay there long, so you might be setting the camera up you know, and then the deer walks out. But I did just kind of preliminarily just try moving the bag and the gun around, and it's, it's quiet. quiet, and it's quick and efficient, and just drop the bag on the two by four, rest the gun on there, and then you could easily get behind it, and it was as stable as shooting off the bench. It was the perfect stand to shoot out of, maybe just not the best place to film out of. But there are certainly some intricacies to filming hunts that is very difficult. And, uh, you know, without getting nerding off on this, because it's really not y'all's, y'all don't have to worry about this, but it's just something that I'm considering for us. I'm sure you'll see some shots of this stand in the W. We're going to build some lower ceiling mm -hmm. uh, walls and make kind of a little slit. That way we can, you know, maneuver a little easier, and that, that should alleviate a bit of that. So I guess that would be one important thing, too, if you're going to film your hunts. Uh, is to make sure you understand that you know you've got to be able to maneuver cameras and gear and people mm -hmm. quietly and efficiently, and you've got to really shoot the deer twice because you've got to get the shot set up, mm -hmm. the camera shot, then you've got to make the actual yeah. shot, and it can be a lot of pressure on a on a shooter. So um, we really do relish the opportunity to do uh, a lot of hunting content, mm -hmm. and we really enjoy doing it. I enjoy running a camera, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a great time with Shermichael. One mm -hmm. thing I'll just mention, we're going to be doing another video about some of our experiences on that hunt, so stay tuned for that. But there's also a Warrior Poet episode coming up that I'm, I'm pretty sure we're all going to be in because we were all there together, and you're definitely going to want to see it. And it involves Shermichael and John at Guns Out TV and their first deer hunt that we were very lucky, lucky and privileged to be a part of. So make sure you go over to Warrior Poet mm -hmm. Network and check that out. Mm -hmm. Shameless plug for John and yep. Warrior Poet Network. But check it out and make sure that you, uh, you know, that piece of content, you're definitely going to want to check it out. I think you'll um, like it. I will say, you know, this year I hunted more this year than I think I ever have in a single deer season, um, which I'd like to hunt more this upcoming year. Uh, well, even more, but, um, you know, Eric mentioned, you know, shooting the deer twice, right? I think I enjoyed filming these animals this year just as much as I did taking one. I agree. And I wish I could have, you know, put more deer in the freezer, but, you know, a couple is enough. Right, but Dude. just filming them and seeing, uh, you know, their behavior and really observing them and learning more about these animals, you know, in their natural habitat. And we got to see some really cool stuff. I mean, we got to see deer doing scrapes. Yeah, you know, we got to see all kinds of wildlife, barred owls, all kinds of crazy stuff while we were out there. It's it's, it's a lot of fun. It's so it really neat is. to observe their behavior. 
You know what I mean? And that's how you learn about deer and that's how you become a better deer hunter is by observing these animals and their movements. And uh, probably my favorite shot of the year, uh, and I know we're probably going to show this off in the next video, but I can't help it. I'm, I'm going to make Chad look for it because he's, he's going to know what I'm talking oh boy, about. Here we go. But the shot where Sir Michael and I were in the devil stand and this big bruiser buck, you know, for a South Georgia buck, it's a big buck. He comes in and I'm filming him and it's just so cool to be able to run the camera. Now, Sir Michael couldn't get a shot at this deer. We're going to go over this in a future video, but it's so cool when you're filming them because you get to kind of relive that moment mm -hmm. and you know how you felt. And, and your heart was jumping out of your chest because you've got a game animal in front of you. I mean, it's just, it's so cool to film it in addition to hunting. So I think that filming deer hunting is also a very crucial thing that we can do because it brings people into the fold. You know, folks that might not understand what it's like to be in a stand deer hunting or to go out and, and to pursue these animals, it gives them a glimpse into the process, into what goes into it, the, the moment that you are setting up the shot, the observations you're making on these animals, all of that comes into play. And I think it's very important that we make the effort to put out this type of content because it helps people understand, you know, what it's like to get out there and hunt. Mm -hmm. And hunting is only a tiny little part of the Second Amendment, right? Uh, you know, hunting is, is an awesome way to get back to our heritage as hunters and gatherers and as, you know, harvesting our own food. I think there's certainly an element to that that we should certainly not ignore mm -hmm. absolutely yeah 100 percent right so any other things you want to add on big bore revolvers I pros mean, cons observations i think that we pretty much covered it all but i know i know this upcoming year i'm going to be hunting with the 460 more and hopefully i'll be able to have a different load developed by that time and get it really dialed in and practice more with it um but like at this point i've probably fired about 200 rounds to this gun yeah. um and you know just if you've shot revolvers in the past uh, this is definitely a step up. You have to kind of change your, like like we mentioned, you have to change your technique just a little bit to shoot these these big bore revolvers, especially off of like a bag rest and such. Um, but very, very exciting taking that shot, and I want to do more of it. Dude, for sure. we're and, going and, to. And look, look, all right, so if you guys How about are, some hogs? Hogs, yes. All right, if you guys are still here. All right, one thing, too, about this revolver, I was talking to some of the engineers over at Smith. I was just messaging them back and forth, asking about, preferred bullet weights like hey i know you guys have shot these guns a lot you've hunted with them probably like what what bullet weights are good like i'm trying 200s is that good for whitetail like, oh yeah 200 is good for whitetail but uh 275 uh yeah don't don't use those in whitetail it it, it blows them in half oh no right <laughs> but you can shoot larger size game as well i mean big bears elk right moose all kinds of crazy stuff with the big powerhouses they've got uh, bullet weights up to, I believe, like 350, maybe 375 in this cartridge. So you've got a wide range of projectile choices that'll work in this revolver, which is so awesome, you know, to have such a wide range of projectiles for multiple purposes. All right. Anyways. So what we're going to end this video with, what do you want to see us hunt with this on the North American continent? All right. Oh right now. Here we like, go. All right. Deer season's over, so there's not a lot of options for us to hunt deer. Uh, with this thing, but there's other things we can hunt. 400 yard alligator headshot. Oh no. <laughs> no. But we're not done with these revolvers. No. So this is just sort of a, a peek under the hood, if you will. And, First and experience. An intro into this big boar revolver hunting. So you're going to see more of this stuff and not be telling tales out of school, but there might be even be some interesting new wheel guns that we might be playing with too. So that that's neither here nor there, but let's just say there might be some other cool things that we're going to be talking about. Have a great day. Uh, Happy New Year, by the way. This is the first video we've made of 2022. So uh, well, definitely a, a big thanks. This uh, is the first video we've filmed in 22. The first one we finished. 2022, yes. Let's put it that way. All the other ones, they were old. You know, they were just in the pile. But yeah. a big thank you to all the folks that have supported us over the years. We hope you enjoyed today's video. We've got a bunch of great content coming up this year. This is the first of many. Um, have yourselves a great day. Many more on the way. And we'll see you soon. See you guys.